All right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Vojta, as you, uh, some of you probably know. Uh, I'll be talking about Columbus Test Technical Query Learning. Uh, this will be the first uh, talk out of two, and the second one will be given by Louis Shatsky right after me. And uh, I guess we know where we are, you know. Um, if you're interested in, in uh, you know, like uh, learning a bit more, you know, this work is on archive already. So, uh, you know, have a look. Um, so first of all, I would like to actually thank uh, both Srinasan and uh, Louis, you know, like uh, for this collaboration. So it was a, you know, like it's a, it's a joint work. It was actually Louis, um, uh, part of Louis' internship project and he was so probably leading author on this. So yeah, it was a great pleasure to be able to join this and uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so here's the outline for uh, what I'll be telling you right now. I will start uh, a little lightly, um, somewhat lightly, uh, by going over learning models. You know, like you uh, probably by now heard it, quite a bit of that. Um, I'll introduce statistical query learning. Uh, some of you may be, you know, familiar with this already. You know, like, but it doesn't hurt to do it again. Um, then I will switch to quantum learning models. So all this is. Basically, going to be introduction for you know, like what follows after. Um, then I'll tell you something about separation between quantum statistical query learning, you know, this will be one of the models that I'll introduce, and uh, quantum pack, and uh, some strategies for the proof technique for some of the lower bounds that we'll be using. So uh, that will be the more technical part of this, and then uh, Louis will follow up after me. Could you speak a little louder? I can speak a little louder. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I'll start with learning models. So this is what you get if you, you know, like feed it into some uh, some of these like uh, you know like uh, image generators. Um, uh, all right. So for the purpose of this talk, you know, I'll I'll be quick. But like for the purpose of this talk, a learning model for me will have uh, three ingredients. You know, I'll start with an instance space that uh, for me will be the set of uh, base strings of length n. Then, uh, you know, like I'll be working with a data distribution. I guess all of you uh, know what it means. You know, it's a distribution over the instance space. And, uh, you know, and the, the uh, remaining ingredient for definition of a learning model is going to be the concept class, a sort of subsets over your instance space. And then I would like to think about learning models here, you know, as a set of <clears throat> oracles where, uh, you know, like each one is going to be indexed by a concept in your concept class. So uh, you know, like, um, if you uh, if you have an instance of your learning problem, like I'll pick a concept out of concept class. You know, I'll start giving you, um, you know, like some samples from the oracle that I'll define. You know, like later, um, and uh, the oracle can also take an input. Uh, and your task as uh, a learning algorithm is going to be to interact with this oracle and form a nice hypothesis uh, that somehow approximates what is hiding inside of the oracle. Um, assuming that you know what, what the concept class is, assuming that, you know, this is sort of like standard uh, something of uh, learning, you know. And, uh, right, and then you may, may, may ask questions like, you know, what is the smallest number of queries you know, actually have to make to the Oracle in order to learn a good hypothesis? Um, a lot of you, actually probably all of you by now know what learning is, right? So uh, there you have an example Oracle, you press a button, out comes an example from a distribution, evaluate it on on the concept. Yeah. <clears throat> but there is an interesting restriction of pack learning uh, called pack learning with random classification noise. So in that model, you know, like you have an oracle that does pretty much the same as the previous one, except that your data, or, or like your, your examples are going to be corrupted by noise. <clears throat> and that noise, you know, like causes a small corruption on the, on the uh, evaluations on your, um, your samples, so, or like on the labels that you're getting. Right. And the reason why I'm mentioning this model is that one really interesting thing is that like if I give you a you know some algorithm that solves some pack learning problem, um, it usually isn't robust to label noise. So you know like if you have um, I don't know like an algorithm for learning parities, um, which works with you know Gaussian elimination, um, in the pack learning framework, as soon as you add some small constant level of noise you know, like the algorithm is going to fail. And, <clears throat> and I mean, like very early on, you know, this is worked by Kieran's actually. Um, Kieran's observed that not exactly for parities, but like for many of other learning tasks, uh, what works very well is to collect a bunch of samples and take statistics over them. And, uh, 
basically, um, you can make a lot of algorithms robust by empirical averaging, by this way. And this is, this is the thing that motivated him to you know, introduce the model of uh, statistical query learning. So in that model, you, know, you have yet another oracle. Now, yeah, tell me. Just as clarification on the previous, when you say pack algorithm, I mean, pack theory tells you whether something is learnable or not. One well, means there exists an algorithm. Right, right. When you say pack algorithm, you mean any algorithm satisfying the pack criterion? So, or so something canonical? Sorry, um, what I mean specifically is that is an algorithm that works and uh, that interacts with this oracle. Uh, by, by but then effectively, this. you know that there exists an algorithm which is going to work with label noise. Sorry? That there exists an algorithm which will work with label noise. It's the last line you had on the next line, right? Here. Back algorithm can be made robust by empirical averaging. So there exists a back learning algorithm which will be robust. Yes, this is, I think the, the important thing is that the thing that I probably didn't write you know, very well, but it's, it's the many. You know, it, 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 it doesn't hold for, for all of them, but Usually, you know, like when you have an algorithm that uh, works in pack, you can make it robust this way. But uh, the very important exception are, are the parities. Uh, exactly, you know, that's, that's uh, what I'll be mentioning now. So, so uh, most of them that know, you know, the strategy works. And, um, uh, you know, actually, Kearns even thought for quite some time that uh, this, this, this model uh, of classification with uh, Sorry, uh, this model of pack learning with random noise on labels, right, is the same as statistical query learning. There was this, uh, there was this conjecture that you know, like he was able to separate SQ from pack um, based on uh, I'll, be, I'll be talking about it you know, in a couple of slides, but um, <coughs> yeah, well, hopefully it'll be uh, clear. So anyway, this is statistical query learning. Um, there you have an oracle that takes an input. That input is a boolean predicate. Uh, that goes over your instance space and you know, like like also your uh, labels, and um, also a precision, sorry, also a precision parameter, and uh, you know, like you, up, up on every single query like this, like you're gonna get some p hat of chi that is an additive approximation to something that that is here. Uh, this quantity uh, is a weight of your distribution over the pre-image uh, of uh, the predicate that you have here. So whatever maps to one, you know, like, like, like you just marginalize over the distribution. And this, this uh, simulates, you know, sort of like statistics out of a large sample of, uh, um, that is drawn from, from, from D and then evaluated, you know, like, like, like over your concepts. Now, uh, in SQ, uh, there's a notion of efficiency. Uh, sorry that this is a little, you know, like, um, Hard to read, but but uh, you know um, uh, you want an efficient uh, SQL algorithm to be polynomial time in uh, you know the size of the instances, one over epsilon. So epsilon is the tolerance. Uh, actually, that that um, it's it's basically the accuracy you know like with which you uh, uh, eventually output your hypothesis or like you want to output your hypothesis. You also want your algorithm to run in time as polynomial one of, in in one over epsilon and n. And then if it is randomized in one over delta, where delta is the failure probability. And you also want to bound at the inverse of this precision, um, you know, um, by a polynomial in one over epsilon. And, and uh, if you didn't do this, then you could make exponentially precise queries. And that would be bad, because that's not something that you expect to, to be able to get uh, by averaging over large samples. So it's quite important. Mm, tell me. Yeah. The clear question is, is, is here you said efficient. Is it possible you can also like the statistic efficient, like the delta epsilon? That part is kind of also like the asymptotically sort of like the, uh, like in the computational time, not sort of like the, with the connect with the, like the how, how small and how fast asymptotically the go with the, like the sample size. Um. Sorry, sorry, can you? Yeah, so, yeah. so that, like, the, or the, or the, or the, you have a more uh, sample, like the M, like the sample goes to infinity, you can make your delta and the epsilon much smaller, like a converging to zero with the kind of yeah, yeah, I mean, result. I mean, I mean, I mean, this model, you know, it tries to abstract away from, from, from uh, the, this, like, image concentration that you're talking about, you know, like from, from you know, like the large sample limit. So, so, you know, this is like an abstraction over that. So, 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 kind of like always thinking about like this algorithm averaging somehow over the 
sample, you know, like 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 resampling and computing, you know, like like uh, trying to estimate its quantity, but you try to abstract away from you know like the way you do it. It's, it just assumes that there is a way to get an empirical mean of some of some predicate like this. So 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 yeah, but I, I can maybe tell you more after uh, uh, if you if you're interested. Okay, so this is statistical query learning. Uh, this is the interesting thing uh, that that actually happens here, you know, uh, uh, and uh, follows up on the question that Badran had, you know. Um, so Kieran's already, you know, in, 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 his, in, his, in his paper in um, 1998, managed to separate PAC from SQ. And uh, it's, it's actually done in a very, very uh, interesting way. You know, it's uh, uh, not too different from uh, some proof techniques that, that uh, Louis will be t telling you about later. But um, basically, there is a problem, you know, like learning parities that somehow, you know, like uh, uses uh, Gaussian elimination, you know, like um, model to 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 uh, in, in its in its uh, process, and 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 this is something that you can't really do with the statistical queries, you know, like if you if you only have access to expectation values, like like people don't really know how to how to simulate it, and uh, that's the reason why you know like you have a split. Between SQ and PAC, uh, so that shows you that SQ is like, like in some sense, weaker than than, than PAC. But then, in exactly in this paper, like he also formulated this hypothesis that maybe this noisy uh, PAC, because he also didn't know how to uh, run the Gaussian elimination with with, with, with label noise. Uh, that maybe this noisy PAC is also, you know, uh, pretty much the same as SQ. And there was this breakthrough result by Bloom, Kalai, and Wasserman uh, that actually shows that you can modify the uh, the task that is based on, uh, on, on, on learning parties to like a really contrived for one that actually separates uh, a noisy pack and, and, and pack as well. Um, oh, I, yeah, sorry. And uh, yeah, so um, you basically have like three classes that you know like like from are, are like one one is basically weakening of of another, right? Or you can think about them as uh, subsequent restrictions of of, of pack, right? Um, so quantum learning models, you know, uh, it's another you know thing that I mean, this is how a quantum learning models look like apparently. You know. um, Quantum pack, I guess uh, most of you are familiar with it. Uh, it's just a coherent version of the of the usual pack you know, proposed by Pichot and Jackson. Here you have an oracle that, that gives you coherent superposition over your uh, you know uh, over your instance space. So, so it shouldn't be big X, but omega or you know, a set of strings. And uh, you know one of the things that is uh, somewhat undesirable about this model is that uh, you can implement, uh, you know, highly entangled measurements uh, over uh, the examples that you are getting. So you can imagine that you collect, you know, okay, many examples like this, and then you apply something very, you know, like like highly entangled, you know, non-trivial. And so, from that sense, you know, like learning algorithms in quantum pack are not really, um, you know, like maybe. Uh, um, very, very hard to implement. You know, like, 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 even if you find their efficient implementation, you know, like, 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 it may still require, you know, like, like, high length measurements. It may not be something that you would like to think about when you're thinking about something more realistic. You know? I mean, like, I wrote that it's not exactly NISC friendly, but I, um, you know, just to clarify, like, I will not be claiming that any of the other models that I'll be talking about right now are anywhere near, you know, like being NISC friendly. But uh, tell me. It's so useful. You're tidying up with all this, uh, uh, yeah, all these words together. But can you again say it's a bit like Bedran? Why is this quantum pack if you define a certain oracle? Because again, pack is something about learnability. Is yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, trying to so follow the, the way. Well, you well, I mean, the the it is true that like pack is about learnability, but I mean, uh, the even the original model of Valiant, right? Like like the one on the first slide. Is defined with respect to an oracle, right? Like, 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 like you have the example oracle that that, that allows you to access data, uh, some information about a hypothesis that you have, right? Okay, and, so, but then quantum pack would be for you that oracle plus the normal pack rest of it. Actually, no. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly that. Yeah, sorry about it. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, you, when you say like the plus normal pack, you know, like I, I, um, I guess you can actually simulate. 
the example oracle invariance uh, model by, by this oracle and just you know like focusing on the computational basis measurements and stuff like this. So um, yeah, I mean that's that's uh, what it is. You, you you have like a stronger access to to tier distribution and, and tier concepts this way. Right. Um, right. So so. I guess you know somebody was talking about the shrinking of a desert, right? Like, so I, so I guess you know the meaningful restrictions of, of these models are uh, pretty much you know like one way to shrink that uh, desert, of, you know, like landscape of, of the learning models that they have. Uh, just, yeah, tell me. You have this Q pack equal pack information theoretically. That's, uh, that's only true for the worst case distribution case. Right? That's that's correct. Then I mean that's just like a side note, you know, like like I I don't like this uh, this uh, paper by Sergey uh, Gortlar, you know, like. Yeah, tell me. I'm just pointing at Srinivasan. Oh, Srinivasan? He proved those things. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <coughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, so uh, one of the restrictions that you can take, um, and um, this is going to be, uh, um, you know, like a, um, a small like, side note. Uh, so one of the restrictions that you can take is a uh, separable QPAC. So you know, like this is the, this would be a model where you have the same oracle as you had on the previous slide, but you force measurement after every single sample you take. And oracle like this appeared in works of you know Robert, you know, and uh, Preskill and and and, 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 um, and uh, a lot of other papers, you know, that, that uh, appeared after that. You can think about it as a uh, restriction to learning with uh, limited quantum memory. The reason why I mention this is that in our paper we uh, also say something about this, although I won't be, you know, like like explaining much about the result. Um, so, um, in some, we, we we basically show surprisingly for, you know, like Boolean concepts. Like in some sense, you have uh, a polynomial. I mean, sorry, the. Um, the uh, complexity of like exact learning with in, in this model is uh, polynomially related to the uh, exact learning in the uh, you know like fully flush model where you can make flash and angle measurements. So if you are interested in that, you know, have a look at the paper. I will be mentioning more about this. Um, the next restriction that you can take, you know, is somewhat interesting, uh, is one that is one that was already taken by Pschut and Jackson uh, in their paper. And they call it, you know, uh, quantum pack with label noise. It is a coherent version of the Angular and Laird model, you know, that, that corrupted labels with, 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 with small probability. Um, it is pretty much a standard definition by now, but uh, if you have a look at it, it's a little, uh, you know, like, it may seem a little unnatural because basically the kind of noise that you're applying here is just a coherent ro rotation. Right. And one thing that I wanted to just mention here, you know, is that I don't think I've seen any work on, uh, you know, like a, uh, a learning model that would take an error channel uh, on, say, like a label re register and try to understand, you know, like what, uh, what does it do to you if you define the oracle this way, right? So, so you have a family of oracles, you know, with like noise channels on the labels and you know, like like it will weaken your 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 QPAC learning model, and it may be an interesting model to analyze because you know, like the way I motivated the statistical query learning, you know, like um, it's kind of more difficult to motivate quantum statistical query learning using this definition. All right, but nonetheless, you know, here it is. It is quantum statistical query learning defined in a paper by uh, Srinivasan, Alex Grio, and uh, Andrew Yun. And here the oracle, you know, like it's is basically as follows. So it takes an input. The input is a uh, definition of a quantum circuit that uh, you know, like allows you to implement a measurement of an observable. So you know, like you know, whatever down here, whatever down here, is that the input is an efficiently uh, some specification of an efficiently implementable quantum observable. And uh, you also have your precision parameter tau, you know, like, like exactly as you had it in, uh, in the in the in the ASCII model. And the samples that you are getting from querying this oracle are, um, uh, you know, like t precise approximations to expectation values of that observable on your state. 
So, you know, you can think about it as if you, uh, as if you, you know, like took your observable and you perform the measurement, and and you go, and you got some, you know, like uh, estimation of the observable within some, you know, like error tolerance that is uh, uh, that is down. Um, in our paper, we usually deal with uh, Boolean function con concepts, so typically your state row is going to be this. But um, you can also just forget about this part here and like think about it as, as some general quantum state. What is really interesting is that uh, Sidney Vassan and, and Alex and uh, Henry and, uh, show that QSQ can, in, comparison, in, 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 in contrast to SQ, learn parities. So it's very surprising because if Kearns managed to separate SQ from PAC by this parity learning problem, you know, like you can't really separate QSQ from QPAC by, by, by uh, parity learning. You have to think about something else. And I guess the something else is something that Louis will, you know, like be uh, telling you uh, a bit more about. And in the rest of the talk, I'll, be, uh, I'll set up for the lower bound technique that he'll use to do that. Yeah, tell me. Are parities learnable in the noisy quantum part? Oh, uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. <laughs> um, I, mean, I mean, in some sense, like, like um, up to subtleties, right, as you saw in the previous slide, like, you can, as you, as you thought about, like, SQ, like, this specific, um, basically, because you can think about SQ as a specific, like, weakening of the noisy bug. In some sense, you can think about QSQ as a weakening of some version of the noisy Q pack. Even though, like, like here, you know, like the correspondence is a little indirect because they they are using this weird, you know, like like uh, coherent uh, version of the of the of, of the label noise. But um, I would say that that would be the intuition behind this. One uh, small remark I would I would like to add here. Um, we recently learned, learned about work by Alex Needner. Um, maybe he's, you know, like watching. Uh, I don't know. Um, he defined a really interesting, uh, in interesting extension of this, uh, where instead of uh, evaluating expectation values on single copy of row, you you can work with expectation values on multiple copies of row. And then, then he studies this in, in his upcoming paper. So I find this really interesting because you know it allows you to so, so somehow like you know uh, interpolate between. You know, like a learning model that has access to only to like one single sample, then you have a learning model where you can, let's say, implement the swap test, right, and and so on. So it's very interesting. Um, but I guess that paper will appear uh, at some point soon. So. All right. Yeah, tell me. Is there any chance that in some limit, they in fact, they are equal Q, QSQ and QPAC, or do, do we know that they can? Uh, do you, you do mean like as you, as you increase the number of copies? Yeah. Uh, I guess Alex will tell you, you when, he, when, he, when, he, when he actually actually puts it out, like he may have some results of that. Uh, okay. So there is a lot of other motivation for for uh, studying QSQ. Um, you know, um, you can pull it back to learning of quantum states, um, and that's uh, why it's interesting. I mean, like one of the main motivations for us is that. Uh, you know, because uh, quantum algorithms currently rely on error mitigation, and error mitigation is about improving estimates of expectation values. You know, uh, and this model works with expectation values. You know, it's sort of like nicely tailored exactly to that. So um, to be that, and uh, it also works nicely with the work that Ryan was talking about. Uh, you know, a couple of days ago, uh, it, to some sense, you know, like the, uh, the thing I'll be talking about right now. Uh, you know, generalizes part of the work, you know, so, so, um, right. And so with that, uh, let me start uh, by going over the lower bounding technique that you can eventually use to separate QPAC from QSQ. So this will be a little more technical than, than was uh, uh, done so far, and uh, it will contain some uh, material from our paper. So, as you saw a couple of slides ago, you know, like the central question here is, you know, if QSQ can efficiently learn parities, then how do you separate quantum pack from 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 SQ? Uh, like, like how do you show that this is like a strictly weaker model than that? And um, 
in order to, to be able to think about this, so I do this, you have to be able to prove lower bounds on QSQ. I have to show that, that something is hard in the model. And uh, so this brought us to uh, this recent, I call it a program, because it really is a sequence of papers that go over you know, maybe like a decade. A uh, program of uh, uh, characterization um, of uh, statistical query lear learning complexity by Vitaly Feldman. So he has this really nice paper where he basically shows that there is a uh, combinatorial parameter that can uh, characterize the complexity of uh, SQ learning problems pretty much you know, um, completely. So, and the, and the question is like, okay, well, does uh, do these low, low, lower bounding techniques go through quantum layer? Right? That's what we are trying to address here. And so, the way Feldman's proof techniques actually work is that he starts. Uh, with uh, something that he calls a many versus one decision problem. Right? Uh, the decision problem is uh, defined as follows. So we have a reference state sigma, and you have some set of states uh, you know, uh, outside of sigma. And, and, uh, and the task here is that you know, if I give you a state from the union of the two uh, sets, you know, like either I give you sigma or I, I'll give you like one of the states that is an S, you know, um, I, I will ask you to decide using, uh, in our case, a quantum stat queries up to precision tau, uh, whether I gave you, you know, like, like um, um, whether I give you sigma or I give you a state that is not sigma but is in, in, the, in the set S. And I'll call the complexity, or like the query complexity of uh, this task, uh, QQC delta tau, uh, S of sigma. The reason why I have delta here is that uh, your algorithm for deciding this task may be randomized. So, you know, like the delta is a failure probability of that algorithm over its internal randomness. So, like the way it processes the samples, uh, like the queries that you're getting, maybe, uh, may allow for some like small uh, failure probability, right? And, you know, the reason why I switched, hey, tell me. Um, can you say a bit more about the motivation for why you have a single reference state versus a, a set of states as opposed to just two sets of states? And yeah, yeah, it's simpler uh, to, to prove it this way. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, um, other than that, there is no other motivation. Um, so the reason why we care about the task specifically is that there is a reduction from, uh, you know, like um, learning to decision. Uh, you know, like here, you know, like I, I said, like from decision to learning, but um, actually, sorry, it is, a, it is a reduction from decision to learning, sorry about it. <laughs> In fact, um, so, so, so if you do have a learner that, uh, you know, gives you a nice hypothesis over some set S, and you have a, some some nice reference state, then then you can relate. Uh, you can basically lower bound the complexity of the learning task by um, the complexity of the decision problem with respect to some reference state. Yeah, tell me. So in, the, in, the, in the decision problem, do, should we think of a distribution over C, or or is it sort of the worst case? Or, or yeah, I mean like uh, for now, I like, think about worst case. But then then uh, yeah, then. Uh, so if it's a distribution, it becomes a optimal distinguishing case, right? And then the, yeah, the yeah. optimal operator, and that's yeah. the thing, okay. Right, uh, okay. And so, and so basically, like, uh, this is one way of reducing, you know, uh, the um, decision to learning. There are other ways, you know, like if you, for example, know that, that your, your reference state actually lives in your concept class, you know, like you may do a little better than this, but, uh, you know, like, like it, this, is a, this is a really nice way of doing it. Um, and so basically, uh, you can show uh, that uh, under the premise that your sigma is at least two uh, epsilon plus tau uh, far far away from some set C. So now I'm thinking about it. So that's my concept class already. Uh, then, if I have a um, uh, if I have a, a quantum statistical query learner for this concept class. 
Uh, and, uh, and I find some reference state you know, like the, that satisfies this condition that I can lower bound the, um, you know, like the um, query complexity of, of, uh, of the learner by the decision complexity um, of the many versus one task. And so then it becomes a question of like finding basically the right reference state if you want to use this. In your, one thing I would like to mention, uh, you know, similar result appears in Ryan's paper. It's not a coincidence. You know, we are uh, talking to them because uh, we are like, like, like working on this paper con con concurrently. So, you know, uh, although in their case they uh, don't do it for, uh, for quantum states in general, it, it happens for distribution. So. Um, so, so, how is this different to like agnostic learning? Finding the reference state? Huh. Um, I don't know right now, and uh, maybe you can discuss it uh, after. Yeah. This is, it's not a decision problem, it's not really agnostic learning anymore. You're not trying to. Well, no, no, I understand the decision is oh, yeah. different, but like if you're finding the reference state, then how is it different? Finding the reference state. Oh, sorry. Uh, what I meant by the uh, reference state right, is that you have a you have an you have an, you have an inequality here, right? Um, you have an inequality here, right? And this is the uh, complexity of the of the um, of the decision problem. This is the complexity of the learning problem of, over your concept class, right? So so here, you know, like, uh, you no. Know, no, I know, I know, but like you have, uh, you, you have a set of decision problems. So for any reference state that I pick, any sigma that is outside my concept class, mm -hmm. I'm going to get some bound here, right? Yeah. And I want to optimize, I want to find sort of like a supremum over, over here to get the tightest lower bound on the, on, on, the, on the learning task. But the learning task, you know, like has nothing to do with sigma anymore. Right, okay, but the learning task is you want to find some state close to some... Yeah, it's not really, we're not really concerned at any point. We're assuming, like, you know, a priori what the concept class is. You know, the set of plum states oh, that yeah, you're yeah, trying so. So, 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 so here in this, in this task, you have perfect knowledge of what C is. Okay. Right? But, but here, you know, like, like, like the lower boundary, like, you want to find, like, a, you, you want to make a nice choice of, of your sigma to, to, to get a nice lower bound. I think the important thing is that. This is like a reduction between realizable learning of C and like testing C against the reference okay. state. And so like if the testing problem is hard, then you know that the problem of realizably learning sure. C is hard. Okay. Then, thanks. <coughs> All right. And uh, right, so 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 now now I would like to tell you something about uh, lower bounding the um, Complexity of the decision problem, you know, like uh, basically the 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 right hand side of this expression, right? Because we, I mean, like so far, I only told you that it characterizes the complexity of the, of the decision task, right? and that it lower bounds the complexity of a learner. But uh, I didn't tell you how, you know, like like what to do with that information. So um, this is the part where it, uh, you know, like. Uh, it comes to stage. So, so I would like to uh, now talk about something called a tau cover. Uh, this is a notion that was also introduced in Feldman and we, you know, like uh, translated to quantum. Uh, like translated to quantum, I mean, like, you know, uh, this is a quantum version uh, of that that works for QSTAT. Uh, so imagine that you have this problem, you know, where you're trying to distinguish sigma from some set that will be calling C and no longer has it. Um, then, I can define D to be the smallest integer <laughs> such that I will be able to find D observables M1, M2, up to MDE, such that for any row in my set, there will be one such observable that will be able to distinguish it by quantum statistical query from sigma. Right? Um, right, because I mean, like, I'm making quantum statistical queries with precision tau, and, you know, so I'll be able to see at least on one of them that uh, sigma is different, you know, like from from um, a given state through. And a nice way to think about it maybe is that like if you imagine that this is your concept class C, with like four states, then this set of observables induces a cover 
um, over that set. You know, like, so every observer will correspond to a set of states they can distinguish, you know, like from sigma by 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 the given measurement. And uh, then it's pretty obvious that uh, you know if if you find if you find a tau cover like this, then you can solve the 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 um, decision problem. You know, like with uh, up to up to d many you know like queries. Um, precisely if you're querying these observables. So this is a nice mental picture to have, but it's very hard to find tau covers directly. You know? And for that reason, you know, Feldman defines this notion of uh, quantum statistical dimension, where, um, which you can think of you know, like as a uh, generalization of uh, or this notion of a tau cover to uh, something called like a you know like fractional tau cover, where, where he basically thinks about distributions over coverings, you know, like over your uh, over your concept class, and um, you know if you massage that the, the expression that he defines in his paper a little bit, and you know like there's some form of like duality involved, you will arrive uh, at this expression here, like at at at, at this definition here. So. Um, you know, um, you fix the tolerance, then uh, C is going to be a set of quantum states. Uh, you know, like, because we are talking about a decision problem now, it may or may not be a concept class. And you have one state that is outside of that set. And uh, then you define D to be the smallest integer, uh, such that you will be able to find a distribution over measurements. Um, or like over Q stack queries M that will satisfy the condition here. So basically what this condition means here, you know, it's a little difficult to unpack, but what it means is that like, you want to find a set of measurements such that, you know, like for all sets in your row, you'll have like a decent chance of, uh, you know, uh, basically distinguishing uh, row from sigma if you draw your measurements from the distribution. Right? And one when I when I briefly mentioned the like like latest notion of a duality, like one of the things that's quite interesting here is that you know the um, I mean yeah if I mean if you are uh, what I want to say is that like there's uh, you know like some form of like some analogy to like Yao's principle here, you know, like involved because here, if you if you're familiar with that, but um, um, I guess you know that's not uh, that important. But anyway, so uh, having this definition, uh, defining that small as the d, you know, that, that uh, is such that this thing is satisfied here as your quantum statistical dimension. You know, with, with respect to some reference state sigma and like some set C, um, you can show that QQC, which is the complexity of, the, of solving the decision problem with quantum statistical queries, is lower bounded by one minus two delta uh, Q as the um, C of uh, sigma. So, so you can lower bound, you know, like the, the complexity of the decision problem by the quantum statistical dimension. Now, again, you know, this is not. Uh, completely, you know, our, our idea, uh, but built on, on the work by Feldman, so quite heavily. Right. Now, uh, <laughs> um, I would like to, uh, you know, sketch uh, the proof of uh, lower bounding, you know, QQC by the quantum statistical dimension, because it's uh, it's quite um, it's quite neat. Uh, although my slide isn't as neat as that. Um, that proof is, uh, you know, like by an adversarial argument, or you know, like uh, you, what I mean by that is that you're trying to understand what happens if you have an uh, adversarial oracle, and, and like how how long can you basically stay consistent with uh, the adversarial oracle in order to you know like uh, have a meaningful meaningful algorithm and meaningful output, right? So to see that QQC, the, the complexity of the decision problem is lower bounded by QSD, um, you can imagine that you have some algorithm, uh, call it A, uh, that, that can make quantum statistical queries and uh, succeeds with probability one minus delta. 
And um, the queries that the algorithm will make, you know, like you can label uh, M1, M2, up to M, MQ. And then you go by contradiction. You assume that you were not given, you know, like an oracle for, for QStat, but you're given some adversary that um, tries to fool you and uh, to any query that you make, it, 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 it returns some expectation value evaluated on your sigma. So irrespective of the input to the problem, you know, like if you, if you put in sigma or if you put in any state from, from C, you know, it always gives you um, expectation values that are consistent with sigma, right? But then you can have a look at the probability that a, uh, some fixed you know, like row from uh, C can be distinguished from uh, sigma, and the probability is gonna be given by this expression here. So here, you know, this probability uh, of A is over the internal randomness of the algorithm. So that, you know, we, we had some discussion yesterday uh, that, that would also include adaptivity of the queries, right? So, so basically as you go, like, you may let the algorithm adapt uh, based on what, what, what outcomes it sees. And, um, you know, like then the probability basically, uh, like the event that you uh, go over is uh, existence of one measurement that manages to distinguish sigma from rho. So basically, you, you can think about it uh, as follows. Like the algorithm, you know, like it, uh, it starts making q stack queries. Uh, it may do that adaptively, but like as long as you see like one query that, you know, distinguishes. Like, like I, I, ideally you would like to be able to distinguish at least like one over, uh, sorry, one mass delta. Um, um, fraction you know, like of states uh, this way to free algorithm to, to succeed, right? And this is sort of like a success condition for algorithm. So then you know that if you um, if you still have the adversarial oracle that, that you know always outputs something that's consistent with with mid sigma, you can uh, imagine that actually not imagine, but like then 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 it has to be with an input rho that equals sigma, the algorithm can only give you the answer that your input is in C with probability that is upper bounded by delta, right? But then, since all the, the responses of that faulty oracle were fixed to, to this thing, you know, like then the algorithm doesn't really like know that you gave it you know, like something out of C if you do, you know, like that you gave it something else than, 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 uh, than sigma. Which also means that like, if you give it some input from C, uh, the algorithm has to output the same, um, um, the algorithm has to output that the row is in C, which is the correct answer, with probability that is also upper bounded by delta, right? So it, get it, it gets confused and you, and you have some contradiction. And from this, you know, uh, you, you, you can get a necessary condition on what, on, on, on what this, uh, sorry, by a necessary condition uh, on the correctness of this algorithm, like you get a lower bound on the probability of uh, success, uh, which is here. And then you can massage it and you will recover the expression for the quantum statistical dimension. Right? And that's how you lower bound uh, the uh, co complexity of the decision problem by the combinatorial parameter called the statistical dimension. Right, so now um, this is uh, an outline for the uh, strategy for like proving lower bounds on QSD and also like eventually separating QSQ from QPAC. This is our key goal. So, um, over the past couple of slides, like you saw that how I can use QSD to lower bound QQC. So QSD is the quantum statistical dimension, QQC is the you know, complexity of the discrimination task. Then you also saw how QQC can lower bound QSQ if you choose the right reference, you know, like state. And uh, to get something concrete out of it, like you have to be able to lower bound QSD. And this is uh, what Louis will be talking about. And, uh, and this is, uh, I mean, I would say that while this chain and everything I was presenting so far was pretty much like retracing Feldman, uh, these two things, you know, for lower bounding QSD are, are sort of like the new meat, you know, the, in, in our work and um, the, the, the really interesting thing. And I guess, you know, like Louis will tell you 
more about it. All right, so conclusion so far. Uh, I hope that I uh, made a case that for QSQ. Um, I think that it is a really interesting restriction of QPAC. And it is worth looking into, especially you know, given that we, we all work with expedition values. Um, I uh, hope I conveyed uh, the fact that we can prove lower bounds on QSQ complexity. And um, you know, especially the proof technique, and I guess you know, we will uh, tell you more uh, about it now. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So.